Farmer for Legal Services. And I do apologize because I put together a presentation and this morning when I tried to pull it up, I was told my file was corrupt. So I critically pieced together some things and I fortunately also was able to use some resources from the Polaris Project um, to put together this presentation. So I do need to give them a shout out. Um, and bear with me if I seem a little scattered. Um, feel free to stop me at any time if you have any questions about what we're going to go through. So when we talk about labor exploitation, um, that's not always labor trafficking. And so first I want to just talk about uh, the definition of labor trafficking. And I'm sure you guys went through this this morning, but I still think it's a good starting point for any discussion on trafficking. So when we're talking about labor trafficking, um, we're the Trafficking Victims Protection Act defines trafficking as the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for a commercial act, sex act in which commercial sex act is enforced by force, or induced, sorry, by force, fraud, or coercion, or in which the person induced to perform such an act has not attained 18 years of age. And bear with me, because we're gonna break that down in a little bit. That's sexual trafficking, and I'm sure you've heard a lot about that, and I'm sure you've seen it in the news, and I'm sure, sure you've probably even seen some movies that have to deal with sexual trafficking. But the TVPA also defines trafficking as the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for labor or services through the use of force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of subjection to involuntary servitude, peonage, debt bondage, or slavery. So when we talk about labor trafficking, that's the definition that we're using. So again, it's the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person by the use of force, fraud, or coercion with the purpose of subjecting a person to involuntary servitude, peonage, debt, bondage, or slavery. So today, I want to talk about that piece because I think a lot of times when we talk about trafficking, we immediately think of sex trafficking because it's the sexy kind of crime, both literally and figuratively. And I don't mean to make light of sex trafficking because it is very important. It's important that we address that, but we can't ignore labor trafficking either. And so this is the definition that we're going to be using um, to break down that the two definitions a little bit easier. Um, there is the AMP model, which looks at the action, means, and purpose. When we're talking about human trafficking, anytime we're talking about human trafficking, you have to have each of or one from each of these columns. Unless we're talking about minors under the age of 18 who are being um, induced into commercial sex acts. And then you don't need anything from column two. But when we're talking about labor trafficking, even if we're talking about a child, you still need column two. Children and adults are both treated the same in labor trafficking. That doesn't mean that it's lawful for somebody to induce a five-year-old into producing labor. It just means that if that five-year-old is willingly working there without the use of force, fraud, or coercion, it's not trafficking. It may still violate our child labor laws, but it's not a violation of trafficking. And so that would be a way in which you would have exploitation of a worker, exploitation of that five-year-old, but you wouldn't have trafficking. And when we go throughout this presentation, I'm going to talk a lot about exploitation of workers, because a lot of times that's the gateway into trafficking. Um, but we're also going to talk about trafficking as well. When we talk about trafficking um, it, uh, in labor, it could be in any of these categories. Um, any industry could be affected by human trafficking. From December 2007 through March 2011, the National Human Trafficking Resource Center uh, documented the calls that they received and put together this graph to show which industries they were receiving the most calls from. As you can see, they had called the dark blue, I don't know if it shows up very well, but the dark blue uh, says that it's agricultural or farm labor. The yellow is small businesses, um, red is large factories, gray is residential facilities, so that would be like domestic servitude. Um, orange is other types of labor trafficking that aren't included in any of these other pie pieces. So as you can see, agricultural labor is the largest section of calls that they received of potential human trafficking cases. So when we talk about human trafficking, it's not only important to talk about sex trafficking and labor trafficking, but it's also important to talk about agricultural uh, labor trafficking because it's the, as of um, 
as of today, is the largest number of labor trafficking cases has come in um, in the agricultural labor category. It's also important for us to talk about agricultural trafficking and, and agricultural labor exploitation here in Michigan because it's our second largest industry. And so we have a lot of workers working in agricultural labor here in Michigan. Michigan has 56,014 farms with 10,031,807 acres of farmland that needs to be harvested in a very short period of time every summer. Um, so every summer we're hiring workers to come and work in our fields to harvest our crops. Uh, and so those are the workers that I want to talk about uh, mostly today because that's also my area of expertise by working at Farmer for Legal Services. So first we have to look at what is actually agricultural labor. The federal law defines agriculture as farming in all its branches. And among other things, it includes the cultivation and tilling of the soil, dairying, or working on a dairy farm with dairy cows, the production, cultivation, growing, and harvesting of any agricultural or horticultural commodities, the raising of livestock, bees, fur-bearing animals, or poultry, and any practices performed by a farmer or on a farm as an incident to or in conjunction with such farming operations, including the preparation for market, delivery to storage or to market, or to carriers for transportation to market. So what does that all mean? First it means it's gonna include anything in these bullet points, but really it's a very broad category. When we talk about agricultural labor, we're talking about really any type of labor that produces our food. And I don't mean the like, restaurant laborers who come up with our meals, but just as producing our basic food groups, like our fruits and vegetables, our meats, um, and, and our grains. So that is what agricultural labor has to, um, is. It's anything that has to do with our production of our basic food. Specifically um, for today, we're going to focus primarily on migrant and seasonal farm workers. And we're going to do that for two reasons. Uh, first, to date, the majority of federal human trafficking prosecutions in the United States um, in agriculture have involved hand harvesting. So uh, we want to talk about these hand harvesters, these day laborers, um, the migrant seasonal farm workers in Michigan. And second, because we have such a large number of hand harvesters in Michigan, as you can see, we have 19,135 migrant and seasonal farm workers in Michigan. We also have their dependents who are living here, so their family members who are living with them. This makes Michigan with the fifth highest population of farm workers every summer. Uh, these numbers were taken from a survey that was conducted in 2012 and that was published in the study um, this year. So these, these numbers are up to date as of June of 2013. Uh, like I said, Michigan has a fifth largest population of these migrant and seasonal farm workers. And we rank number one in our <coughs> hand harvested cherries, number one in our hand harvested blueberries. We are third in producing Christmas trees and short rotation wood crops sixth in nursery, greenhouse, flora, floriculture, and sod, um, and so on. So Michigan has a large <laughs> quantity of, of fruits and vegetables and products that need to be hand harvested, and we also have a very large quantity of workers who are coming to harvest those products. When we talk about migrant and seasonal farm workers, before we get into why um, they're vulnerable and how they end up um, potentially being exploited or trafficked, it's important to understand who they are. So farm workers are defined um, by federal law, and a seasonal farm worker is any worker who is working in agricultural labor, which now you know what that is. So any of those workers working in agricultural labor, and actually this definition um, under the statute that you see there is a little bit broader than the one we looked at. Um, so it could even include additional types of agricultural labor than, than the one we discussed earlier. But it includes any worker working in agricultural labor for a temporary or seasonal period. A migrant worker is an agricultural laborer who's working for a temporary or seasonal period, but is required to be absent overnight from his or her permanent place of residence. So you can see that there's nowhere in this definition that requires that a migrant worker be an immigrant, 
or be from another country, or be anything other than an absent from his or her permanent place of, of residence. So for example, I live in Kalamazoo. If I were to work detasseling corn near Kal Kalamazoo, I could go there during the day. Detasseling corn only takes a couple of weeks out of the summer. So I could work as a corn detasseler for a couple of weeks. Every night I could return to my home, sleep in my bed. At that point, I would be considered a seasonal worker. If, however, I decided I wanted to pick blue or cherries up in Old Mission Peninsula and um, or do some sort of work up in the UP, it wouldn't be reasonable for me to come home every night and sleep in my own bed. So at the point that I'm working up north, I would still be in Michigan. I'm still a Michigan resident. But at that point, I would be considered a migrant farm worker under the federal statute. I think it's important to distinguish this because especially right now with the uh, the comprehensive immigration reform, there's a lot of discussion about migrant farm workers. There's a lot of discussion about immigration, and it's easy to confuse the two. I think a lot of people confuse being a migrant with being an immigrant, but they're not the same. The UN actually does define a migrant worker as being a foreign-born citizen working in a country that's not their own. So the UN definition um, confuses our definition here in the United States, um, because for us, we would just consider those individuals to be foreign workers and not necessarily migrant workers. Is everybody with me so far? Yes. All right. Is, is there any um, hours that are like, distinguishing between seasonal and non-seasonal? There are. There are more protections for migrant workers, so people who are coming up from a different state. Um, the reason for that is these people are oftentimes being recruited from Texas and Florida, and we'll get into that and how that works a little bit later. Um, but because they're being recruited from a different state, it's important that they understand what their employment terms are going to be before they get here. So it's required that employers provide them in writing, in um, their language, a, a disclosure of what uh, those terms of their employment are going to be. I can tell you that of those 40,000 plus um, migrant seasonal farm workers that we see every summer in Michigan, a very small percentage of them actually get those disclosures, either verbally or in writing. A lot of times they'll get a call from a recruiter that says, hey, we have work in Michigan, come up and work for me. They'll come up and they won't really know what to expect. Or maybe they'll just have been promised verbally um, their basic wage. For seasonal workers, it's not as important, right? Because if they're just going next door to work, and then they're told at that point you're only going to make $7.40 an hour. They haven't had the expense of coming all the way to Michigan. They haven't given up um, other job opportunities to come to Michigan. So they're still required to, to have disclosures available to them at the point that they are recruited or at the point that they're working. Um, but for migrant workers, they actually are required to be given those disclosures at the point that they're recruited, so at the point that they're called in Texas or Florida, wherever they're coming from. So that's a great question. Uh, so in Michigan, our migration pattern uh, looks a little bit like this. As I said, the majority of our workers are coming from Texas and Florida. Uh, many of our migrant workers travel in a crew. So they will have a group of them that will all get on a bus together and come up together, or they'll carpool and come up together. Um, and a, one reason for that is it's an easier for an employer to go and recruit, or to either recruit one person and then, then say, hey, tell all your friends and family to come along with you. Um, sometimes we'll have employers who will actually go to Florida or go to Texas and do recruitment in neighborhoods down there. Uh, and so a lot of times it's family groups that are coming up together or neighbors, uh, and so they'll all travel together. And sometimes they are being recruited by an individual who shows up at the bus and says, hey, I have worked in Michigan, jump on the bus, I'll take you up there, you'll have work, I'll bring you back, um, and, and then that will be your, your employment period for the summer harvest. Uh, so we have some who are doing both ways, some driving themselves um, or coming up with friends, and then we also have others who are coming up on a bus uh, from a recruiter or an employer who actually recruited them in their home state. So while the majority of our workers are coming from Texas and Florida, not all of them are, and there's a couple of different ways that the migrant strains work in the U.S. One is that workers will follow a particular crop. 
So a lot of our blueberry pickers in Michigan actually pick blueberries in Florida and then um, follow the stream up the East Coast and work in North Carolina picking blueberries before they actually come to Michigan and pick our blueberries here. So sometimes employers will actually be in contact with the employers or the recruiters in North Carolina to coordinate their harvest seasons and to make sure that they're going to have their workers on time when they need them. Um, because the weather in North Carolina and the weather in Michigan can both affect when um, they would need their workers. Uh, because they travel in a crew, it means that a lot of times once they arrive in Michigan, they're dependent on that crew leader or whoever brought them uh, for transportation, or maybe they're just dropped off at the camp and they're dependent on their employer for transportation. And so a lot of these workers are actually living out in migrant camps on the employer's property that are pretty hidden. Um, some of them you can't see them from the road and you would never even know that they're there um, because they're down on all these different dirt, dirt paths. So, our, um, so that is one way in which they become vulnerable because they're dependent on other people. Another way is um, for both housing and for transportation and that they're being, uh, or that they're living in a secluded area on their employer's property. Before we get too far into trafficking and exploitation and the vulnerabilities of farm workers, I think it's important to take a moment and define a couple of other immigration terms that you may be hearing um, on the news. First, USCs or US citizens, we all know what those are. Um, the second is LPRs, those are lawful permanent residents, they're also known as green card holders. So those are people who are here with valid immigration status that could lead to US citizen status. They could potentially naturalize one day and become a U.S. citizen. Immigrants are defined as every alien, except an alien who is in a, and I say alien only because that's actually how the Immigration and Naturalization Act um, defines aliens, but really an alien just means any foreign-born, um, or foreign, citizen of a foreign country. So every citizen of a foreign country, except a citizen of a foreign country, who is in a class designated as a non-immigrant. So that's not very helpful, because really it's just leading us to another definition to figure out what, not what immigrants are. So we have to look at non-immigrants. Um, non-immigrants still, well non-immigrants, there are 21 different classes of non-immigrants. So it's defined by the type of visa that they receive. So for an example, a student visa would be a non-immigrant visa holder. In the simplistic and not completely accurate, but best way to think of immigrant versus non-immigrant is just to think that an immigrant has a path to eventually um, become a citizen. An immigrant would include lawful permanent residents. And, and so it has a path of potentially, eventually, gaining some sort of permanent visa status. Whereas a non-immigrant is an individual who's here with a visa, but they don't have, that visa doesn't give them a path to permanency in the US. So it'd be a student visa where once they're, student, once they're done being a student in the US, they would have a date in which they would have to leave. They would either have to apply for a different kind of visa um, in order to stay, which they may or may not have available to them. So uh, um, I think the easiest way to think about it is immigrants have a path to permanency in the US, whereas non-immigrants do not. Their visa doesn't allow for them to stay permanently. Uh, guest workers are a type of non-immigrants. We generally, when we talk about, uh, so one type of non-immigrant is an employer-based visa. So an employer can apply for visas from a different, uh, for workers from a different country if they can show that they don't have enough of those workers here in the US. Uh, the one we'll talk the most about today is H-2A, and because that is actually for the agricultural visa. So an agricultural employer who can't find enough workers, right now there is a way for them to apply for workers to come in from a different country to work for them, and that's called the H-2A visa. The A doesn't stand for agriculture, but it's a good way to remember it. It's just mm -hmm. the section in the, the act that it refers to. And so when we talk about H-2A workers, agricultural, laborers, and then H-2B workers are any other unskilled laborers. So it would be like your restaurant workers, uh, your hotel workers in the hotel industry. If they're coming in on a visa, uh, a lot of the carnival workers will come in on an H-2B visa. So that's anything other than agricultural that's unskilled labor. 
And we generally will refer to those that group of people as, as being guest workers. Um, guest workers are when they're coming in under those unskilled labor employer sponsored visas. And then foreign workers, we already talked about, um, that would be any worker who's a citizen of a different country who's working in the US. Um, whether or not they're doing so legally, they would still be considered, considered a foreign worker. And then undocumented workers are workers who are in the US without any sort of lawful uh, work authorization. Now you can be in the US lawfully and still not have lawful worker, um, and still not have permission to work in the US. So somebody who's here lawfully could still be, um, or somebody who's here unlawfully would obviously be an undocumented worker, but there would also be some people who are here lawfully, but they're still undocumented workers because they don't have the, the appropriate work authorization. So for example, a visitor's visa, the non-immigrant visitor's visa, that's a visa that doesn't provide work authorization. So if somebody was here on a visitor's visa and still working, then they would potentially be an undocumented worker. And that's not an official definition, that's more just, um, those are terms that we use when we're talking about immigration. So it's not defined in the Immigration Act. Um, just briefly, lack of immigration status is not a state or federal crime. Um, it's a violation of the Civil Immigration Act. Um, so it's actually not a crime. I just think it's worth pointing out because a lot of times when we talk about individuals who are in the US unlawfully, we'll call them illegal aliens. And it's just important to note that they're actually not breaking, not necessarily breaking any criminal law. Um, they would just be violating the, the Immigration Civil Code. So, um, who's picking our berries? Uh, they, according to a 2005 National Agricultural Workers Survey, 20% of the workers in the U.S. are U.S. citizens. 21% uh, of of our agricultural workers are lawful permanent residents. One percent are otherwise work authorized, so those would potentially be those H-2A workers that we we're talking about. And then 53 percent lack authorization to work in the U.S. at all. So we have about, or around half of our agricultural labor force is, um, according to this survey, working unlawfully here in the U.S. And any time you go down that scale, from U.S. citizen down to lacking work authorization, you're increasing the vulnerability of that workforce. Uh, for one, because even if they're a lawful permanent resident, that doesn't guarantee that they can't be deported. There's still ways that they can be deported. And a lot of lawful permanent residents aren't aware of what those actual ways are. And so when their employer comes up to them and says, hey, if you don't do what I want you to do, I'm going to call immigration and have you deported, a lot of them don't know that that's actually not true, that an employer can't just call up and, and deport a lawful permanent resident. Some US citizens don't even know that. We had a call from a client who was a US citizen and a family member of his had actually gotten upset with him and said to call immigration. And he was legitimately fearful that, well, he was very fearful that he was actually going to have immigration call on him and that immigration was going to show up at his door. Immigration can't deport citizens. They have in the past, but that was a mistake. And they shouldn't in the future. Um, citizens are here lawfully and they can't be deported. Lawful permanent residents, however, have not gained the status of undeportable. So potentially they could still be deported, um, not for refusing to do something that their employer tells them to do, though. And then the 1% who are otherwise work authorized, um, when, those are, when we are talking about those agricultural workers, they're actually coming to work for a specific employer for a specific job. So potentially, they actually, their visa, their stay in the US is completely dependent on their employer. And then those without work authorization obviously do have immigration to fear as a potential threat. Um, there was also a study done in Michigan um, as to how many lacked, how many people in Michigan uh, lacked immigration status, and I had that, but I think I lost that in my um, this morning. But I have those numbers, and so if anybody's interested in that, that's something that I could potentially provide you. Uh, so who's picking our berries? Um, 
There are 70% have limited English proficiency, 18% have um, English as their, their native language. As you can see from this pie chart, 81% said that their native language was Spanish. Uh, we see a lot of Spanish speakers here in Michigan, but we also see we had a group of Creole workers who spoke, or Haitian workers who spoke Creole this past summer. Um, we've had some Thai workers. So it's not just necessarily Spanish speakers. And we do also have a large group of English um, speakers as well in Michigan. Question, so are these statistics nationwide or are these Michigan specific? These are nationwide, okay. yes. The average highest level of education of farm workers is seventh grade. Um, it's not uncommon to see workers with a lot less education than that, and a lot of times their education is coming from their um, home country, even if they're lawful permanent residents or uh, they're here with a visa, a lot of times they were educated in, in a different country and have uh, little to no education in the U.S., and then on top of that, just little to no education in general. We did actually see, um, I have actually met some workers out in the fields who are college students. Some of them will go back and work in the fields. And we also, uh, or, and we actually had a family who um, their kids had graduated from college and had gone back to working in farm work. So that does happen, um, but it's very rare. So before, um, so due to the various demographic factors that we talked about, agricultural workers can be susceptible to labor exploitation and human trafficking. Um, there's several additional reasons that that can happen, but first to talk about just those demographics. Um, we talked about the dependence on a crew leader, the depend living in a secluded area and being dependent on them to take them to any sort of store or um, to take them to the bank or to take them for any sort of social services. Another way, however, that it can be uh, difficult for farm workers is that some of them don't even know where they are. They're brought up on the bus, like I talked about, and they're taken to an employer's camp, and they might know that the guy who drives the bus that tells them where to work and tells them what to do, his name is Frank, but they don't actually know their employer's name. They don't actually know where their employer um, is located or where their housing is located. We even have workers who don't know that they're in the state of Michigan. Um, they just call us and say, I don't know where I am. Frank brought me here and now I'm having these problems. Can you help me? It can be very difficult to help a worker figure out where they are. Um, and especially because these camps are so secluded, a lot of times there aren't any clear markers, like there's not a Walmart that's down the street, or they're not on a road that has a street sign because it's just some um, dirt road in the, in the back country. So it can be very difficult for them to figure out where they are and who they're working for. That obviously creates um, a challenge for them. Also, a lot of times, lack of English. So they're also dependent on that crew leader to translate for them, to talk to their employer on their behalf. Also, just the lack of family support or community services. If you don't know that you're in Michigan, you oftentimes aren't gonna know what services are available for you um, in Michigan, so that can be a problem. And then lack of education, like we talked about. So when there, you have a lack of education, there's also a lack of options in the US. For most jobs, uh, you do need a, a high school education or you need uh, a college degree. And so just the feeling like this is the only job that I can get, so I better take it no matter what they, how they treat me and what they give me. Other challenges for farm workers, however, are the way that our laws are structured. The agricultural industry is, is excluded from several major U.S. labor protective statutes. Um, for example, the Fair Labor Standards Act uh, excludes farm workers from receiving overtime, it also has exceptions for child labor, so children can work in our fields at a much younger age than they could work in any other profession. Even though agricultural labor is considered to be the most dangerous profession in the U.S., um, unemployment benefits in Michigan. Here, we actually have an, an exception for employers who who uh, employ seasonal workers in uh, in a, for a seasonal period from having to pay unemployment taxes on their behalf. 
And so those workers, once their season ends, they can not they can apply for unemployment, but a lot of times they're not eligible because their employer has sought the exception and isn't paying taxes on their behalf. So they can't actually receive any unemployment for now that they no longer have their seasonal work. Um, and so they have no other wages or no other income. Uh, the average income in farm work is the lowest of all labor. In the average wage for fa a family of five it, in farm work is between 12,244 and 16,773. The pe federal poverty guideline, however, states that the um, poverty level is 25,790. So you can see the average for a family of five. So you can see that the average worker is actually making a lot less than what the federal government considers to be the minimum wage for workers. One reason that is, is that even though we talked about the Fair Labor Standards Act and how it is, um, has some exceptions, it still requires that workers are paid the minimum wage. However, in farm works, oftentimes workers are being paid on a piece rate, which is lawful to pay a worker on a piece wage rate as long as it's above the minimum wage. And what we see is that a lot of time, or if the piece rate ends up falling below the minimum wage, that they would um, pay the difference between the two. What we see happening is that a lot of times employers are paying based on a piece rate, but aren't keeping good track of the hours that their worker is working, or isn't recording them correctly. And so they're ending up paying on a piece rate, and whereas if they would have been paid based on their hours worked, they would have received a lot more it's really hard to show that because they have no record of those hours that they worked. Um, so a piece rate, for example, would be, in Michigan, it's common for workers to receive around 42 cents per pound of blueberries that they pick. Um, so in order to make the minimum wage, you'd have to pick around 18 pounds of blueberries an hour. So if you have a worker who is only picking 16 pounds of blueberries an hour, they should be receiving $7.40 Michigan's hourly minimum wage because they didn't make enough to pick the piece rate. If they end up picking, uh, if they end up picking, let's say, 20 pounds in, in an hour, they would make 42 times 20, which is uh, $8.40 for the hour. So that would be above the minimum wage, and so that would be fine. But if they're making below the minimum wage, they should actually be receiving the hourly wage rate. And it can be hard to do because in farm work, they don't have to receive any sort of breaks. Um, they don't have to receive any sort of t paid time off. Um, another challenge for farm workers is the different state laws. So like we said, they're migrating and they're coming through all of these different states. Well, each state has different laws. In Michigan, our minimum wage is $7.40. But in Florida um, and Texas as well, I believe, the minimum wage is $7.25. So a lot of workers get to Michigan and they don't realize that they should be paid here $7.40. Uh, so when they're being paid less than that, it's not something that they even think about complaining about because uh, they're not used to, to making that much. Uh, some of the other laws that can affect farm workers are the, like I said, the unemployment law. Each state does their unemployment um, in their own way. Just to make sure, we go until 3.15 in the or, sorry, 215, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, we already talked about education, English proficiency, income, but also the work demands um, can be challenging for farm workers. They work very long hours. Several of them are working over 10 hours a day, 12, 14, 16 hour days. Sometimes these fields are located far away from where they're living. So we've heard of workers who are being transported an hour and a half to get to the field where they're working, have worked for all of the hours of daylight, so worked for 10 to 12 hours that day, and then transported an hour and a half back home. If you put that together, they're working um, very long days. They're getting home, um, you know, eating, trying to wash their clothes, and getting up and going back to work the next day. And they're working, usually during the summer harvest, they'll work every day as well, unless it rains. Um, so it could be seven days a week, 14 hour days um, each day. It's very strenuous labor. This is a picture of um, 
asparagus fields. I don't know if any of you have seen asparagus as it's grown and harvested, but workers will actually sit on um, these wings that come off of the tractor and they'll stoop over all day long and cut asparagus and just cut it and put it in a basket. It's very hard on your back. It's out in the hot sun. It can be 80, 90 degree weather um, and they're doing this all day. And like I said, it's dangerous work. Um, for a couple of different reasons. It's dangerous for one of, um, I mean, when you're working around machinery, uh, potentially that can be dangerous. Uh, there's also been workers who have been out in the fields when it's been raining and lightning and have been electrocuted. Uh, there have been workers who have been sprayed by pesticides. And a lot of times workers, um, when they're sprayed with pesticides, don't even know about pesticides or the negative effects that it can have on them. So it can be very dangerous, and especially when they're repeatedly in contact with those pesticides. There are protected laws um, so for farm workers. So specifically, um, in 1963, Congress recognized the abuse that these farm workers were suffering. They recognized that these workers were being promised something in Oklahoma, and then by the time they got to California, we're being told something very different. Who's read or seen Grapes of Wrath? So they recognized that that was happening, that these workers were being recruited and promised these great wages, and then they would show up, and there'd be so many workers that nobody could get a good wage rate. And so Congress created a law that was meant to protect farm workers from that kind of recruitment. And in 1982, they, um, revamped the law into what we now use and know today as the Migrant and Seasonal Agricultural Worker Protection Act. Uh, we call it the APA. The APA was passed uh, to establish protections related to the disclosures, so making sure that these workers are receiving a disclosure before or at the time of their recruitment. It also required postings similar to this poster uh, that would tell workers what their rights were once they got to the camp. So they would have a poster like this at their housing and at their place of employment that would advise them of their rights um, during that employment and at their housing. And I will tell you that I very, we go out to the migrant camps and I have maybe seen this at 5% of the camps that I've been to. It's not very common for these postings to actually be posted. Um, at one of the camps, they did have a poster, which was really excited until we noticed next to it was a Fair Labor Standards Act poster from um, when the wages were still $4.20. Mm -hmm. so, um, so it's very rare for there to be postings and for them to be the up-to-date postings. But the Agricultural Worker Protection Act also regulates the way that these workers are transported. So it ensures that the workers uh, or is meant to ensure that the workers are being transported in a vehicle that is certified by the DOL. Um, also, in it, with the driver who has insurance and a license and that the, the vehicle is also insured. It regulates the housing and requires that their housing um, be licensed by a state agency. So in Michigan, the, my, the Michigan Department of Agriculture will actually license our housing, uh, our migrant camps to ensure that they're, they meet state and federal safety regulations. This year, uh, or this year we're lucky because the Migrant Department of Agriculture was operating at a deficit and they didn't have enough inspectors to do a pre-season inspection before the workers got there and an in-season inspection, so once the workers were already there. This year um, they have raised the number of inspectors that they have, so that's actually happening more frequently, which is good. Mm -hmm. Question. Um, so if it's pretty common and understood that these postings aren't being made, what kind of repercussions do the, do the agricultural businesses actually ever feel for not following those rules? That's a good question. Um, a lot of times when it's just a disclosure violation or just a posting violation and nothing more, they'll feel nothing. Um, because no worker is going to complain if they come up here and they actually receive what they expected or they didn't really have any expectations but they got here and they liked their employment. Um, so a worker's not going to complain and it's harder to, to enforce that. Uh, the Department of Labor does do inspections and enforcement inspections and does randomly inspect agricultural employers so they may also deem them. But if it's just a mere like disclosures or postings requirement um, violation, those are considered technical violations. And so if they have any fines, it's going to be very minimal and usually they'll consider it abated if the employer begins to provide those. 
the, uh, the Migrant Seasonal Agricultural Worker Protection Act also requires that workers are paid uh, the uh, wages when due. So that would mean that they're paid based on paid state and federal law. So in Michigan, they should be paid $7.40 per hour or whatever the promised case rate was, whichever is higher. If they're not, for each of these violations, a worker potentially is eligible for $500 in statutory damages based on that statute. So they may be eligible for wages under the Fair Labor Standards Act that they were owed and weren't paid. But in addition, they potentially would be eligible for up to $500 for each other violation in the Agricultural Worker Protection Act. The problem is that a lot of workers don't want to bring forward these issues unless it's a severe violation of their rights because one, they might not know what their rights are. Two, if they complain, then are they going to have work the following season? And if this is the work that they're depending on, um, that can be a very scary thought for some of them. Three, uh, their housing is oftentimes tied to their employment. So if they lose their employment, they would also be losing their housing. Uh, so we also will find that a lot of workers, at least during the season, they will say, yeah, we have all these problems, but we don't want to do anything. We've already come all the way here. We need to shop to make enough money to get back home. And so we'll tell them, we'll, you know, call us when you get back home. And if you want to do something at that point, um, we can talk to you more about what your options are. So there are options for them, but, but a lot of workers don't want to complain. Um, a lot of workers see it as being, this has been the way it's always been. This is how they're treated in every state. And so um, it's just the way things are. So one of our jobs is to make sure that workers understand what their rights are and um, make sure also that community members know what those rights are so that we can be advocating on their behalf. Another requirement is the record keeping. This is another violation that we see frequently um, where, worker, where employers are um, providing adequate pay stubs to the workers or are keeping adequate records or both. Um, when that happens, it can be very difficult to calculate when a worker has a minimum wage violation. Uh, it can be very difficult to, to show what that minimum wage violation actually would be, especially if the worker hasn't kept track of, track of their hours throughout the season. Um, so another thing that we do is we actually hand out calendars to workers and we encourage them to keep track of their hours and to keep track of the pieces that they fit. So if their employer doesn't keep a good record of that, they can still double check their wages to make sure they're paid correctly, and if they're not, they have a record that can help them do something about it. Um, so I want to talk again about the H-2A Desperate Worker Program because this is another way that workers are coming to Michigan to work. Um, right now, the Guest Worker Program has an unlimited number of visas. Uh, so if if all of our migrant workers in the U.S. decided they never ever want to work in farm work again, all of our employers would be able to actually bring in enough workers for, each, for um, all of their open jobs because there's no limitation that's been set based on the number of workers that can come in. A lot of the different visa other visa categories that we talked about have limitations, like the h 2 b visa category. That is limited, and there's only a certain set number of visas that can be authorized each year in the H2B category. But for H2A workers, employers can apply for as many as they want and can bring in as many as they want, as long as they first show that they couldn't find enough workers here in the U.S. And they have to be they have to um, be certified by the Department of Labor that there weren't a sufficient number of U.S. workers uh, available for that job, and that. In addition, importing those foreign workers is not going to have an adverse effect on the wages and the working conditions of U.S. workers. Once they've done that, they can bring in U.S. workers and those work, or they can bring in foreign workers, and those workers would have specific rights. Those rights also have to be off, um, offered to any U.S. worker that applies for the job. So, for example, um, one of the rights, one of the worker protections under the H-2A program is that workers must be provided a um, adverse employment wage rate. And in Michigan, that's $11.30 for agricultural employment. So anytime an employer was applying for foreign labor under the H-2A program, they would have to promise any of their workers working in that same job $11.30. In addition, they'd have to provide free housing and they have to pay for the transportation from that foreign country 
or from inside the U.S. to the place of employment and back home again. This year, we did have several employers in Michigan who were applying for H-2A um, workers, which I find surprising because I have one of the, the largest um, one of the largest H-2A application that an employer did was for 230 detachment workers, and it was in the Kalamazoo area. And um, I was after the season had ended, I was talking to some friends at church, and um, one of the women actually said that her son was looking to do housing work this summer and just couldn't find work anywhere. Um, so they are required to promote these available jobs, but in that case, that employer was certified to bring in workers, and um, there were detasseling, high school detasseling kids in, in my area that were willing to do those jobs. Um, one of the other, Specific rights for H-2A workers is that once they once these workers are brought in from a foreign country, they're guaranteed employment for at least 75% of the work hours that they're promised. Um, so they can't just get here and then the employer say, okay, I decided I don't want you, I'm sending you back home. Um, they can do that, but they still have to pay them for 75% of, of those hours. And the, um, they would also have to reimburse those workers for the travel costs to and from the place of employment. However, there's also a 50% rule, so up until the 50%, um, so for the seasonal period, up until the 50% of those hours have been worked, that employer also has to hire any U.S. workers. Um, any U.S. workers that apply for that job would have priority. So as a result, an employer potentially could end up having an overabundance of workers because they've already brought in these U.S. workers, or these foreign workers, and now they have U.S. workers that show up at the door and, and want those jobs as well, and they would have to provide those jobs to the, the U.S. workers, but they still have this um, three-fourths guarantee that they, they're obligated to fulfill for the foreign workers. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So if they're supposed to, like, reimburse them for transportation or for things like that, but if these people don't know about these rights that they have, and that these things are supposed to be happening, how often do they not happen? That's a great question. Um, so one way that any foreign worker that's coming in under that program is required to receive, a, or is given by the Department of State a um, brochure that talks about their rights. And actually, the National Human Trafficking Hotline um, has recorded the calls, and the majority of those H-2A workers who were here and were trafficked or exploited um, actually called because they knew of their rights based on that brochure. So that's one way that they find out. Um, another way is, is those workers are also represented, well, those workers have the right to have legal aid uh, come and talk to them about their rights. So offices like mine can go on to those H-2A camps and talk to them about what their rights are. Um, so those are some ways that they find out about it. It makes it more difficult for U.S. citizens to find out about it. Um, because a lot of times they just know that there's a difference between what they're being paid and much what the H-2A workers being paid, and that's unlawful. So sometimes they'll just call because they won't understand why, um, but sometimes they think that's okay. And so we try to go out to those camps and meet with both the H-2A workers and the U.S. citizens to make sure that everybody understands that those H-2A um, workers' rights, those specific rights, are also available to the, to the citizens and to the lawful permanent residents who are working there as well. Um, despite all of these protections, the H-2A visa system is sometimes exploited by employers and or recruiters who will charge exorbitant fees to the workers. This is unlawful, but it happens. Um, so one way that they may do that would be, um, would, well, so one way that they do that is at the point of recruitment, they'll say, okay, we want you to come and work for us, and then they'll charge them a fee. And when they do that, that is, not allowed by the H-2A program, but it still sometimes happens. Um, another way, and, and that is a way that they can end up holding workers in debt bondage or refusing to pay those workers um, because they'll say, well, you owe me this recruitment fee or you owe me um, the fee that I, for bringing you into the U.S., a smuggling fee. And that's another thing that I think is important to, to talk about really briefly. Um, when we talk about smuggling, have you all heard the difference between smuggling and trafficking? Do you know about, okay. So smuggling is um, just, is a crime against the, the country or a crime against the state. It is the crime of crossing, illegally crossing 
border. Whereas trafficking is a crime against an individual, and it doesn't necessarily require movement. The primary element of smuggling is the movement of a person or a thing, so smuggling guns or smuggling people, um, whereas trafficking is a violation against a person, and it could include that movement, but isn't necessary. Um, so smuggling oftentimes is a gateway into trafficking. Um, one way that it's done is that a recruiter will go to Mexico, for example, and say, hey, Mary, there's a job available in the US. I'll take you across, or, or hey, Mary, you want to go to the US? Pay me $500, and I'll get you there. And Mary says, yeah, that sounds great. Um, and pays, but the problem is I only have $250 right now. Let me pay you $250. When I get to the US, I'll live the American dream. I'll make a lot of money, and I'll pay you the other $250. And bad guy says, OK, that sounds good. Bad guy then brings in Mary, and if Mary is free to go on her way and pay him back in any way that she wants, then that would be, bad guy would still be violating smuggling laws. He would have brought her in unlawfully. He would have crossed the border illegally and brought her in illegally. At that point, he's not a trafficker. But at the point that he did so for the purpose of a sexual commercial act or labor exploitation, um, or labor trafficking or sex trafficking, at that point he becomes a trafficker. So if, for example, he got married to the US and said, okay, you still owe me $250. Instead of you going out and making that however you want, here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna work for me, or you're gonna work for whoever, and you're gonna stay there and work there until you pay that money off. At that point, it's become a debt bondage. And so at that point, the act of smuggling became the act also of trafficking, but it's not always combined like that. Um, just want to make sure. So some common violations um, that we see in the fields are every time that any time that there's ten or more workers working in a field, they should be provided with bathroom facilities as well as water within a fourth of a mile of the, where they're working. Um, a lot of times we won't see these in the fields, and so workers either will go to the bathroom and the trees along the side of the field, or they'll hold it until they get back. Um, this is a really big problem, especially because it could cause uh, well, yeast infection for women or other urinary tract infections. But also, it can lend to sexual harassment or sexual um, sexual abuse out in the fields. They're also required to be given water, but and and have a single-use cup for that water. So the employer should be providing cups and water in the field. Um, we had an employer last, a couple summers ago, who provided water, but he provided one Gatorade bottle for all of the workers to share. So they would have to hope that none of their neighbors had any sort of um, viruses or colds. Uh, we talked a little bit about pesticides. Uh, pesticide is also a, a big problem in the field. Um, and then discrimination. There's a couple of ways that we've seen discrimination in Michigan. One is the discrimination against the elderly and not wanting to provide these various generous jobs to elderly workers. But also we've seen uh, discrimination against the young in that um, there was a, an expo a couple years ago on child labor and it included Michigan farms. And so a lot of Michigan farmers became very scared because they wanted to make sure that they didn't have any kids working in their field, which is a great thing. But as I said, kids, um, young kids can actually work in the fields younger than they can work in other professions. And so an employer actually put up a sign that said no kids um, under the age of 18 can be in the fields or the camps. And then I think this one shows 14 because he did eventually change it. But that's still wrong. Kids can actually work in the, in the fields at the age of 12. So some of these families would come up and they would expect their kids to work and their kids planned on working and then they would get here and find out um, that their employer wasn't going to allow them to work in the field. In Michigan, we still consider that to be um, age discrimination that's against our, our civil rights uh, laws. So that would be another area of exploitation, but not necessarily trafficking. Um, some co other common violations that we see in, in Michigan are um, problems with the housing that they're being housed in, uh, the lack of bed frames, so sleeping on the floor, uh, rodents being in the, 
able to get into the unit, not having screens on the window, and so having insects come in. Um, we see a lot of drainage problems. You can see up in the right hand, uh, left hand corner, there's a, a picture of a, a leak. We had one unit that they couldn't use their stove because water, whenever it would rain, water would just rush in. It looked like a waterfall. And so they couldn't use their stove. They always had water in their unit. They had a lot of mold, and so that can also cause health and safety concerns. So to summarize, um, we've talked a lot about trafficking and exploitation, but what is the difference between the two? And I think to determine that, we have to go back to the trafficking um, definition again. The trafficking definition is to recruit, harbor, transport, provide, or obtain a person by the use of force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of subjecting a person to involuntary servitude, damage, debt bondage, or slavery. So when we're talking about labor exploits, exploitation, when we're talking about migrant seasonal farm workers in general, we're gonna have the first bullet point, right? We're going to have the action. We're going to have somebody probably who's recruited them, somebody who's transported them, um, somebody who's provided them with housing and employed them. Sometimes it could be by the use of fraud or coercion. They promised them something and then once they arrived in Michigan, they were given something different, either no wages or underpaid or um, the housing wasn't as they expected it to be. But a lot of times in Michigan, we won't see that third bullet point. We won't see the purpose of subjecting that person to involuntary servitude, damage, debt bondage, or slavery. Trafficking requires all three, the action, the means, and the purpose when we're talking about labor exploitation, whether it's kids or adults. Exploitation may have the action and means. It doesn't necessarily require those actions and means that are in the trafficking statute. Um, but oftentimes, when we're talking about exploitation, you'll still have those action and means. You'll still have the lack of payment or the underpayment of workers. But there's no purpose that meets the trafficking definition. Um, those workers still have the freedom of movement, and that freedom isn't limited by the employer or by the recruiter. Also, that freedom to leave um, without retaliation. So they know that if they quit, they could leave and they're not going to um, be beat up for leaving. However, they often still have a fear that harm will come to them if they leave. And that might just be the fact that they're not going to get paid all of their wages, or the fear that if they leave, they're not going to find employment elsewhere, or the fear that if they leave, they're not going to be able to come back next year. But those fears, um, while real and while they keep workers in jobs where they are being exploited, it still doesn't rise to the level of trafficking um, because there still isn't that purpose of, of the trafficker in the mind of the trafficker to subject that person to involuntary servitude, payment, debt bondage, or slavery. Um, so we're running out of time. Do any of you have any questions? I do want to say these are some of the enforcement agencies in Michigan. Um, so if you hear of any of these issues, definitely don't hesitate, hesitate to call the human trafficking hotline. Um, they take calls about exploitation as well as trafficking, and they'll put, put those workers in touch with agencies that are able to help them, including these enforcement agencies that we have here in Michigan, as well as um, offices like my office or other similar legal aid programs throughout the country. Um, and these are some additional resources. And in case you guys want to write this down, I'll just leave it here. And then if anybody has any questions, it's 2.15 now. Um, but I do want to answer any questions you guys have. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That average income uh, that you showed a little bit earlier, was that per worker or is that for like a whole family who might be employed? That was for a family of five. Who are all, who are all working? Um, well, it's for an average family of five. And so... That's a good question, um, how many people are actually working in that. So it's um, not just one worker. It's just at, looking at average, yeah. the average family household yeah. income. So it could be more than one worker. So it is more than one worker because I know the average household income for an individual is much lower than that. Um, but I'm not sure how many of the five yeah. are actually working. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, so as I'm kind of reading it, it boils down to money a lot of the times. Um, so are there any um, 
federal, state, or um, just kind of economic incentives for the employer to um, to be traffic free or to be clean? Is there anything that promotes him to do that? A little bit. I mean, in the sense that any time that you have a lawsuit against you, if that becomes a, a public lawsuit, then you're going to have the bad press. Um, also, just if there's a lawsuit against you, it costs money and takes time, and um, so so those are definitely issues. Uh, other than that, there's like the free trade program that we see um, in other countries. There's nothing like that here, although there are some groups that are working on putting together different sorts of uh, labels that would include social justice as one of the, the components. So for a lot of the, the companies that are already doing like the organic foods label, a lot of them are starting to include a social justice component. However, a lot of that is just self-regulated. So it's employers who are choosing on their own to to say, hey, I'm a good guy, um, but it doesn't actually have any enforcement tied to it. So they're still looking at, there are some groups who are looking at ways of, of doing that more so that consumers can also help control some of the trafficking um, and exploitation issues. But right now it's really just avoiding the potential legal ramifications of violating this law. Mm -hmm. What's well, kind of like the general atmosphere of employers been just in responding to this? Like, have they been willing to go along with changes, and, well, not changes, I guess, but in fulfilling like these obligations, or has it been more of like a hitting a wall kind of thing? It depends on the employer. There's definitely um, so a while back because of the reduced funding of the Michigan Department of Agriculture, they um, they started issuing a fee for their licenses, and it was still pretty minimal. But there was some pushback on that, and there were some growers who said, "Hey, I know you only have three inspectors at that time. They didn't have very many inspectors." So I know you can't get to all of the camps, so what's the chances you're going to find mine? So there's actually one owner who um, did get caught running a camp without a camp license and was fined, and his response was, I never thought you'd find me. Like, I didn't think it would, you know, I didn't think I'd get in trouble, so I didn't get a license, and I didn't get my housing inspected, and it turned out to be not up to code. Um, so there's, there's definitely a variety of attitudes. There's, a lot of employers who, when they see our office or any outreach worker show up at their camp, they're very um, suspicious of us and try to keep us out, which makes me suspicious of them. Um, but we've had some, sometimes we'll have problems with the lack of access. Uh, in Michigan, we actually do have the right to access those camps, and workers have the right to receive services from service providers at their camp. Um, they also have the right to have visitors, so just friends come to their camp. So when employers are preventing that, there's some remedies for it, but we've seen more and more of those problems where employers are just saying, I don't want to come to camp at all. Um, so then that makes it harder for these workers to get that information. Have employers been, um, I guess, like very aware of some of the usual obligations and things like that, or it is, like, what's kind of, I guess, the general tone of that to, like, do they say, you know, I didn't know, or was it more? That happens too, and especially for some of those smaller employers, um, but there are, there's, there's conferences all with Fair Loan where actually Farm Bureau and some of the other agencies will hire private attorneys to come in and give a presentation um, to talk to the workers about what those rights are. Uh, we've given presentations at those as well where we've talked about what the obligations are of employers. Uh, so there's way, and the Department of Labor has a wealth of resources based on trafficking as well as just the general um, other protective statutes. So I think the information is out there. It's still sometimes used as an excuse of why I didn't know, um, but that's not a legal justification for, for not following the law. Um, so yeah, I think that there are resources available. There are employers who are trying to do the right thing. We've had employers who have actually called our office to say, hey, my neighbor is not paying his workers um, and is providing really crappy housing and isn't giving them bathrooms in the fields. Will you go check it out? Um, we've also of uh, the one trafficking, agricultural labor trafficking case that was prosecuted in the U.S. was actually brought to the attention of, um, of enforcement agencies by an, a grower who said, I think my recruiter is trafficking people. I can't talk to my workers because they speak Spanish and only speak English, but I gave him the checks for all the work, or I gave all the workers their checks, and then I saw this guy take them to the bank, and um, as they were casting their, cashing their checks, he stood there and they handed him money. Okay. So there are some growers who are, you know, looking out for their workers, and some growers who consider their workers to be family members and treat them very well. 
Um, and put Michigan Radio on there as a resource because actually just last week there was a, um, a really great investigative um, piece that was put together by Emily Fox on agricultural work and they have a segment on H2A work in particular and that in Michigan, um, but they also have it on uh, some of the wage issues. And so if you're interested in this issue, I really recommend uh, checking it out. There's three different segments and each one's about 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so it's, it's, it was very well done. Well, thank you. I think uh, it's time to move on to your next question. Thank you.